Years and years ago, when I was in a high school writing class, we were all asked to write our own obituary. And I remember us all laughing nervously because it sounded so macabre. But it was the teacher's sideways device to get us to write about our hopes and dreams. What would we want to be remembered for someday? And it made me wonder what Martha would have wanted to be remembered for. Because most of us remember the Martha depicted in Luke's gospel, the busy beaver who's reprimanded by Jesus and chastened to be more like her spiritual sister Mary. But I don't think that's the Martha Jesus knew and knows to this day. The stories we have about Martha give the sense that she was the oldest sister to Mary and Lazarus, that she was smart and capable, responsible and trustworthy and solid, kind of like Miriam, Moses and Aaron's older sister. No mention is made of Martha and her siblings' parents, so perhaps that indicates that both their mother and father had already died. But all these three siblings were apparently living together, so since neither Martha nor Mary are introduced with any other male associations except for their brother, and also no wife is mentioned for Lazarus, it is reasonable to assume they were all young and as yet unmarried, and that Lazarus, because he was the male, would have been the head of their household, but Martha, as the elder sister, would have been the matriarch. Now both Luke's and John's Gospels indicate that these three people were part of Jesus' inner circle of friends and, and supporters, people who Jesus loved and entrusted himself to. Some scholars surmised that Lazarus was the rich young synagogue ruler spoken of in Matthew 19, the one who eventually did come to faith and become one of Jesus' close friends. And judging from their means, the ability to house and feed Jesus and his disciples and those traveling with him, and also owning between them at least one full pound of nard, which was valued at a year's worth of wages, Martha and her household were among the wealthier inhabitants of Bethany. So the Gospels tell three stories about Martha. In the first story, she opened her home to the Lord Jesus and those who were traveling with him. The next place we see Martha and Mary is at their brother's funeral. Both sisters were deeply hurt and disappointed that Jesus had delayed in coming. And then finally, Martha's last appearance, she was once again serving dinner at a large celebration in Simon the leper's home, and it was thrown in honor of Jesus, but also her brother Lazarus, because he was so recently raised from the dead. So we'll begin with busy, bold, and burdened, the story in Luke. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. This is Jesus. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying, but Martha was distracted by her many tasks. Bethany was not even two miles from Jerusalem, so that made it a very popular stopping place for travelers, especially near the three festivals that were held annually in Jerusalem and that drew those of Jewish faith from all over the known world. And the way the story reads, Jesus happened to be in town. So Martha may not have been ready for such a large party, but she did welcome Jesus and all his traveling companions all the same. Pulling a meal together in ancient times took quite a bit of effort and coordination. I, I mean, just think about what it would be like even today with all our modern conveniences and, and at least 13 or 14 people drop in unexpectedly. So most likely, Considering the wealth of her household, Martha did have servants, and she must have had at least some food and wine already on hand, but hospitality was a central value in first century Greco-Roman world, and it had been for thousands of years in the Mediterranean. So similar impromptu meals are described. For example, when Abraham entertained three unexpected guests, and here's what he did. He ran out to them and he said, let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. And then Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and he said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. And then Abraham ran to the herd, and he took a calf, tender and good, and he gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. And then he took curds and milk and the calf that he'd prepared, and he set it all before these three visitors. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. And then there's another story when Abigail fed David and his hundreds of armed men with food that she'd already prepared for the sheep-shearing festival. 
Abigail hurried, and she took two hundred loaves and two skins of wine and five sheep ready dressed, five measures of parched grain, one hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cakes of figs, and she loaded them all up on donkeys. And then she took those up to David and all of his men. And there's another story, when the witch of Endor fed King Saul and his military attendants. Now the woman had a fatted calf in the house, so she quickly slaughtered it, and she took flour, and she kneaded it, and baked unleavened cakes, and she put them before Saul and his servants, and they ate. And those are just three stories found in the scriptures of people who all of a sudden have guests they didn't expect, and they quickly pulled together a meal, and this is what Martha was doing as well. Now, in Martha's day, it was a position of privilege and authority for a woman to be the matriarch of her home. But it was also the domain reserved for women. The man's domain was outside the home, and in her culture, men and women were expected to remain in their own domains. So imagine the mounting tension when Mary transgressed that deep cultural taboo and remained with the men, leaving Martha to tend their women's work all by herself. So she came to Jesus and she asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. Now, what had emboldened Mary to remain with Jesus? And why did Martha not point out the more obvious transgression that Mary remained alone with all these men? Well, perhaps she wasn't alone, but she had still broken with Martha's convention. Now, there are two passages in Luke's gospel that provide a possible clue of what was going on. Here's the first one. Soon afterwards, he, Jesus, went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. One of them here was called Mary of Magdala, from whom seven demons had gone out. And then there was Joanna the wife of Herod's steward, Hosea, and there was Susanna, and there were many others. And the word used here is polai, the feminine plural for others. So many other women who provided for them out of their resources. These traveling women are mentioned only one more time, and it's at the scene of Jesus' crucifixion. It says, all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So it's very possible other women were there with the disciples in a highly unusual gathering of both women and men disciples of Jesus. Martha's sister had joined with this group to take in Jesus' presence and his teaching. And Jesus' answer to Martha went straight to the heart. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. If Martha had wondered about where her place was in Jesus' affection and Jesus' invitation to be a part of his movement, he would now settle her spirit. What Jesus was doing was huge. It was earthquaking. It was a massive paradigm shift for men and women, for all humanity, because Jesus was reconciling all things in himself. So he told Martha, Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. There is comfort and security in the familiar. And when you and I find ourselves mastering the familiar, it's hard to let it go, even when it's not the better part. Martha's position in her household and her understanding of herself as a woman in her culture and a faithful person in her religion must have given her a sense of presence, of identity, but Mary had chosen something better, even though it was countercultural, and many, including Martha, must have disapproved. I imagine Jesus holding out his hand to Martha with a fresh invitation to step out of her old life and into his better way. And now, the next story, we see Martha as brilliant and brave and beatified. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. 
Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And when Jesus arrived, finally, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Did you notice that reversal? Mary held back and stayed inside their home, but Martha went out to be with Jesus. In all her grief and heartbreak, Martha was now a disciple of Jesus, spiritually attuned, hanging on to Jesus' mysterious promise that what was happening would be to God's glory and that Jesus would be glorified as the Son of God. Lord, she said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. The sisters' note had not asked Jesus to come, but they knew Jesus could have healed their brother instantly from afar, as he had done with the Syrophoenician woman's daughter, as he had done with the centurion's servant, and with the Capernaum official's son. And Jesus had even also raised two people from the dead just after they died. One of them was the widow's son at Nain, and the other was Jairus' daughter. But Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. The Jewish belief at that time said that the spirit of a person would hover over their body for three days, but after that amount of time, the body would become so disfigured, the spirit would no longer recognize it, and it would just go away. So Lazarus was well and truly dead. There was no doubt in anyone's mind. But Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Martha knew that on the final day of judgment, Lazarus would be raised up with the righteous to live with God forever. And that's what you and I believe today. What we don't expect is that if we pray over a dead body, it'll come back to life. So Jesus' response is one of the great I am passages in John. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if they die, they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will certainly not die in eternity. Now, John's gospel had already introduced the idea that Jesus was life. Right away at the very beginning in the prologue, John said, in him was life, and the light was the life of human beings. And then John brought the theme back a little bit later. He said, everyone who drinks from the water of which I myself will bestow to them, this one will not be thirsty into eternity, but rather the water that I give to them will become in them a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. Those were the words that Jesus had given to the woman at the well. And then later again, he said, Amen, amen, I say to you all, that the one who hears my word, the Logos, and who believes the one who sent me, God, has life eternal and does not come into judgment, but rather has changed places out of death into life. Amen, amen, I say to you all, that an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and the ones who hear will live. You are not to marvel at this, because the hour is coming in which all these in the graves will hear his voice. John's whole gospel had been leading up to this climactic point in the narrative, where Jesus was going to demonstrate what he meant. And Jesus helped Martha to see that what he said was literally true. Lazarus was not going to remain dead but become physically alive and very soon. This was gonna happen because Jesus himself is the life. Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus was not simply talking about philosophy or being doctrinally correct or looking at one day in heaven, but a real and physical resurrection to physical life. Jesus told Martha that whoever died physically, if they believed in Jesus, they would still live, and everyone who was alive and believed in Jesus would never die. It was a stupendous statement, and you and I have to marvel that Jesus saved one of the most block 
foster spiritual truths in the entire gospel for a woman, for Martha. He hadn't even told his disciples these things, but here he was with Martha, telling her. And so Jesus challenged Martha, he said, Do you believe this? And Martha moved from the intellectual belief in a resurrection some day to a full belief that Jesus is himself God, the Son of God, and the long-awaited Messiah. She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. An hour later, Jesus presented Martha with a public watershed moment. Roll away the stone to Lazarus' tomb. And she hesitated. The fourth day was one day more than the traditional time left open in case a person might revive. What must that have been like for Martha? Even though she was a follower of Jesus, she was still the responsible matriarch of her home. And even though she had come to a stupendous moment of faith, she was still a faithful Jewish woman in good standing with all the religious dignitaries who stood before her. So Jesus spoke into her uncertainty. He said, Did I not say to you that if you believed, you will behold the glory of God? And in that moment, Martha was transformed. And she found courageous resolve welling up inside her. Faith involves doing hard things. And obedience to God reflects belief in God and God's word. Martha would have to put her belief on the line in front of her sister, in front of all the temple elite and teachers of the law, in front of all their extended family and people who had come down from Jerusalem. But in response to her willing faith, God raised Lazarus up in a prophetic demonstration of Jesus' own resurrection to come. In the last story, we see Martha bonded, balanced, and beneficent. Six days after the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, and there they gave a dinner for him, and Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. So once again, Martha was serving dinner to a big party at Simon the leper's house, and it had been thrown in honor of Jesus. Now, notably, Lazarus, who had been just raised from the dead, and Simon, who had been miraculously healed from leprosy, were there, sitting there with Jesus, because they were living testimonies of Jesus' power. And there's a sense of serenity. Martha, deeply satisfied and at peace, serving at this banquet. She was worshiping in her gift set and in her skill set, giving to the Lord the very best of herself. She also was setting the scene for Mary to give the very best of herself to Jesus. Both of these sisters loved Jesus, and both were Jesus' disciples. Together their ministry blessed Jesus physically and emotionally and spiritually, affirming him in his humanity and in his divinity. Jesus and his disciples were often hungry. They seldom got rest, and Jesus even talked about how they regularly had nowhere to rest their heads. In other words, they slept outside in the rough. Martha's hospitality was a rich and wonderful gift, offering a place to eat and rest and stay. And Martha's courageous faith, as well as her faithfulness, opened the way for many others to come to faith. Mary's gift was prophetic. She listened closely to Jesus. Even his own disciples did not listen that well. Their hearts were sometimes hardened. And Jesus talked about the people's calloused hearts not listening, not understanding, and about the religious leaders who should have been among Jesus' most ardent supporters, having hard hearts. The Apostle John said Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. Yet Jesus entrusted himself to Martha and to Mary. And this is what gave Martha peace. For she knew who she was in Jesus. She knew Jesus loved her. She knew Jesus was thankful for her faith as well as her gifts of service to him. She knew who she was now in this new way. In the first story, Martha couldn't see that what Mary was giving Jesus was as worthy as what Martha was trying to do for Jesus. Martha was trying to make her sister do what Martha thought was the better work, the right work. 
Martha couldn't see her sister for who she really was, and Martha's sense of injury for herself was real. She felt overworked and underappreciated and even unnoticed by the Lord when she was doing what she was supposed to do, what women do. In that story, Jesus intended for Martha to become aware of her sister and of the value of what Mary chose to give to the Lord and to receive from him, but also the value of being with Jesus. Martha understood. Now both sisters were united as one in their service to the Lord, preparing for Jesus a gift so magnificent, so prophetic, and so core to the gospel that it would be recorded for all eternity. It is one of the most intimate scenes in Jesus' whole life. Jesus received from Martha that night and he received from Mary. Both worshiped in their ways, giving the Lord a rare blessing. They worked together, supporting each other. In this way, their love and honor to Jesus was multiplied. And I think this is the way Martha would like to be remembered, as a woman of bold faith and blessed service who was able to leave the conventions of her old life and enter into the grace and freedom Jesus offers, who opened the doors of her home and her heart to Jesus and all who came with him, who is bonded in love and faith to God through Christ.